Miami. Um, okay, it's, it's going to take it take its sweet time here. Um, I might not get to all the things I want to talk about today, but um, my my general approach for these kind of seminars is I, I always kind of start out with. Uh, trying to go way too deep on information when I start planning it out. And then I realize that, oh, people are coming in on a lunch break or on a lovely Wednesday evening and might not be ready to look at like complex graphs and things like that. Um, so <laughs> um, I am going to try to keep this more as, uh, borrowing a lot from the beginning of my coastal biology courses at Mount A. So I see a couple of my former students in attendance, um, and they will know I am shamelessly cribbing things from the classes that, that they have seen. Uh, but I really, uh, am, main thing I'm cribbing is being a hype man for coastal uh, life and coastal conservation. Um, so I know that the, the talk was ostensibly about uh, coastal restoration, uh, but, but I, what I'm going to focus more on is essentially the why of coastal restoration. Like, what are the reasons that you might not classically think of as to why we should conserve and restore uh, coastal sites? So, and I might not get to the one of the main ones I wanted to talk about based on time, but so if people have burning questions about seagrass, we can save that for later, or I can just talk about that at the end. Um, so let me go ahead and share this now. Okay, is my screen being shared? Oh, um, the I need to be allowed to do this by the host. Oh, so sorry. Um... That's why I wouldn't it. Okay, no problem. Okay. Okay, try it now. Okay. Wonderful. Is that working now? Yes. So a bunch of nonsense up there? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, without further ado. Down that way. All right. Does that look good for everybody? Looks great. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so my my uh, kind of randomly chosen title here for what we're going to talk about today is, is better living through blue carbon. Uh, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, blue carbon refers to how we can uh, fight climate change and particularly the release of carbon to the atmosphere through um, restoring ocean ecosystems. Uh, so I want us to, the, hopefully the goal of this is to kind of expand your idea of what valuable ecosystems are present here in Atlantic Canada, uh, if you're not familiar with all of them, and also to kind of convey what some of the threats, but also some of the powerful solutions that they offer us in terms of conservation, uh, even on a global scale. So it's not just worth protecting them because they're pretty and we like them, but because they provide some critical services for us. Uh, and before I dive in, I do want to uh, give a hearty thanks to the folks at EOS for hosting this. Um, I am not asked to do this um, when I <laughs> am showing you guys uh, a pitch for their work. Uh, sorry, I don't know why my screen is going backwards here. There we go. Okay. Um, I just want to point out the wonderful stuff that they do, um, as well as encourage folks. I assume that people here are supporters and are aware of their events and the great things that they do, but if not, uh, I would 
encourage you to attend these events and more things like this, and more importantly, to give your money to EOS um, because they do a lot of amazing things for this community. And this is why I'm happy to drop in on webinars like this and, and share some of my time because they do tons for the rest of us. And I really encourage everyone to support them in any way they can. Um, okay. So one other thing I want to give a plug for uh, is the uh, webinar that was done through the same program last year by Dr. Jeff Allerhead, uh, which is great, which is much more focused on um, particular issues in the, in the case of uh, salt marsh restoration. And I should say, I'll, I'll kind of mention briefly some of this stuff from uh, Dr. Allerhead's work um, in my talk, but this is something that I talk about a lot in my courses. And I think that Jeff's work and the work of the people who have done this is some of the most amazing examples of coastal rest restoration I know of, period, let alone in our area. So um, I really encourage everyone to check that out as well if you're interested in this topic. And I also wanna give a little background about me. I feel obliged, I've done this for these other webinars, but I feel obliged to uh, actually explain what my background is and that I'm not just some lunatic off the street uh, coming in here and making up things about marine biology. Uh, so a little bit of background about what I study and what my expertise are in. Um, I am a pretty, uh, pretty good poster child for having attention issues <laughs> and, and focus problems. And that is reflected in my interests. So I tend to work across a lot of different fields and integrate a lot of ideas. And the, the research that I do tends to look at the processes that happen at the cellular level in microorganisms and how those processes scale up to affecting higher um, levels of the food chains and, and overall ecosystems, particularly in coastlines and the open ocean. And then in turn, how that can affect large scale processes, what we call biogeochemistry. So that's things like the carbon cycle and how elements and the key ingredients of life are cycled throughout ecosystems. So, I'm very interested in how large scale processes are driven by tiny small scale processes is the shortest way to say that. So one thing I also wanna do, and I think it's important for any kind of public talk like this is to actually take a step back and say, why the hell should we care about what we're talking about? Because sometimes that's not, we take that for granted. And in terms of, why we should care about coastal restoration or coastal ecosystems in general. Um, it is fair to ask why, because there are a lot of other problems in this world and there are a lot of other ecosystems that are threatened. So the kind of key points that I would make about why we should care are that coastal ecosystems are responsible for about 30% of all what we call the productivity. So that's just essentially photosynthesis that can be used for other organisms and oxygen being produced on our planet. About 30% of that is coming from coastal areas. So you can thank your coastlines for every third breath. And these coastal ecosystems, even though they essentially represent just a ribbon of area around our continents, they hold a huge fraction of all the species on this planet. Uh, a huge amount of our biodiversity are in these ecosystems. And it's not just coral reefs like you see in this picture that are incredibly diverse. It's many other types of coastal ecosystems, even those around here that hold incredible amounts of diversity. Um, they protect our coastlines from erosion and storms, and they provide other critical ecosystem services. And I'd argue as an educator and a, uh, a scientist, we love them because they're full of unanswered questions and they're full of mysteries for us to explore. Uh, okay. But it is really worth asking why we should care about this when we think about the threats and the scope of the things that we're dealing with. Um, so I can say, like, let's take a step back. We're worrying about coastal ecosystems and look at some other problems that are going on with our planet, right? We have rapid warming, an overall climate uh, caused by climate change, caused by basic problems with our economies, industries, our relationship with the natural world. We've had the large scale removal of natural habitats. Thanks to reason one, we've had lots of pollution and sea level rise. Look back to that reason number one up there about in inherent basic problems with our economies and how we relate to the natural world. Um, 
we're in the midst of what we call the sixth major extinction event in the history of our planet, driven by all these things ahead. Um, and there is absolutely major amounts of human population upheaval that are going to come from these continuous threats. Um, there's no way around that. Um, so we know that we have some difficult things to deal with. And then on top of that, for those of us who do care about these things, we often find ourselves dealing with people in our daily lives who care more about what shows just got removed from Netflix rather than all these other problems that we see up here above. So, yeah, it, it's hard to actually, you know, make a great case sometimes for protecting our little uh, coastal ecosystems. Um, so I, I really do want to make the point, though, that like when, when I say things like that it, it give you a bunch of uh, list of the world's problems. I, I'm not trying to make this talk into like a, what I would call a glass bottom boat ride for the apocalypse, um, which is what it can seem like when we talk about all the threats and damage that we're doing to the world. Um, this is not just a, a, a bummer trip. So I wanna point out the reasons for hope when we're talking about the context of conservation and particularly with coastal ecosystems. Um, why we should be hopeful about this process and the threats that I just listed. For starters, uh, you gotta have hope or you're going nowhere. It's necessary for change. Um, and also the natural world holds so many unanswered questions. Some of them can even be solutions to our problems, right? And so we need to just accept our ignorance and that there may be solutions out there that we don't know of yet. Um, also, there's an incredible amount of things that we still have to discover in terms of the beauty and diversity of the natural world. Um, to still get us excited about it. Um, and this is something that I have sometimes have trouble expressing to my students. Um, it may seem a little counterintuitive, but I, I would argue that when we think about a lot of threats affecting our environment, that may seem kind of overwhelming and that like, gee, how can we protect anything if there's five different things coming from five different directions damaging it? Uh, but I'd also mean, I would also take that as a, a large amount of opportunities to protect it as well, right? There's a lot of different fronts to fight these battles on. So you can be overwhelmed by that, but you can also see it as an opportunity, right? Uh, as, as military folks would say, if you're a conservationist, it is a target-rich environment, right? So there are a lot of different things that if you're looking for a way to protect ecosystems, the large amount of threats means that there's also a large variety of things that you can do to help them. Uh, and also, I would point out that life has an incredible capacity to recover and adapt if we simply just give it space and time. Sometimes our restoration efforts do not need to be extremely active or proactive. Um, they can just be us not doing things. Okay, um, kind of on that hopeful side, like I want to point out, like I said, the oceans are filled with undiscovered things. And I'm showing pictures of the deep ocean. That's usually what we think of, that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do the ocean floor. But it is important to remember that although the oceans and coastlines are very diverse, we still have a huge amount of that diversity that we have not discovered. Right? Most of the undiscovered species on the planet are in the ocean. And like I said, these coastal ecosystems, even though they're very accessible, a huge amount of those are in coastal ecosystems. So that's another thing to make an argument for why we should protect these, just on the simple concept that, that we might destroy things before we even know they exist. And, and also I'm just highlighting a couple of examples here of our profound ignorance and the amount of discoveries that we make um, in coastal environments all the time. Um, and this is another thing that I think it gives me hope because there are so many things that we still don't know. It's, it would be arrogant of us to just be pessimistic and, and assume that we have no hope when we don't have the full picture, right? And a great example of this, um, we're talking about a world where coral reefs are declining, and they certainly are, and under great threats. But just in the last couple of years, a 500 kilometer long track of coral reef was discovered in the southern Gulf of Mexico. So huge amount of coral reef that we didn't even know existed, that was actually doing quite well. Um, and another example of this, just off the coast of South Carolina, there's a 130 kilometer long deep sea coral reef found that no one knew existed until very recently, right? So th these are the kind of things that also give me hope. Um, and another great example of this, and also an opportunity to look at some cool video, uh, 
seagrasses are something else that I'll talk about as an important coastal ecosystem. And as much as they are under threat, there's actually a lot more of them on the planet than we realized. And one amazing way that we recently discovered this, I say we as in the scientific community, not me, was simply by uh, outsourcing some scientific research to tiger sharks, which like to patrol seagrass beds like this, and strapping some cameras on tiger sharks and letting them roam around and then collecting all that video and data and putting tracking tags on these sharks. And as a result, uh, researchers just learned in the last couple of years that there's about 40% more seagrass on the planet than we realized um, by just putting sharks to work for us uh, because they cover a lot of ground and scan a lot of seagrass beds. Uh, so again, we're trying to make the point that it's not all doom and gloom. There, there is a lot of things out there to still protect. And let's look at that a little more locally. So in terms of coastal ecosystems uh, that are worth protecting, uh, well, all the coastlines are worth protecting around here, but we have a couple really iconic, productive and diverse ecosystems that are worth highlighting when we think about Atlantic Canada. Um, and not all of these are in everyone's backyards. So they might not be things they immediately think of. Um, so let's just take a quick dance through these. Um, in terms of the, the iconic ecosystems of our region, we have things like the Rocky Intertidal, areas where um, we have cobble and large stones and areas where there's a high range in the tide so that we have ecosystems and organisms that are intermittently underwater and then exposed uh, throughout uh, a tidal cycle. And these ecosystems are very stressful as a result of things being exposed to air and to the sun that are usually marine organisms. Um, often being exposed twice a day. But that stress and variability also creates a lot of differences in places to live and ways to live to cope and survive with that. So these are also very productive and very diverse ecosystems as well. Um, and the picture of the large you're seeing there uh, is one from uh, near St. Andrews where I can take my coastal marine biology class every year. And as the folks who have taken that class can tell you like no matter what they think of me and are willing to put up with with my nonsense in class they all love being able to go spend time in these incredible ecosystems um and also showing the picture reminds me of one thing i mentioned to say at the beginning i i you know i pulled these things from lectures and i am not profiting from this in any way so i have definitely not done my due diligence to always give photo credit <laughs> where photo credit is due so anyone doing this please don't sue me i'm not making any money from this um, but that large picture is actually one of mine. We also have kelp forests, um, which are here in Atlanta, Canada. A lot of the pictures that you can find of a kelp forest, or we think about iconic kelp forest conditions, are usually associated with the Pacific, but we do have kelp forests here. They're a little smaller. They're not as tall and impressive, but they are still very diverse and very productive and provide a lot of critical services for us. Talk a little bit later. We also have mud flats and salt marshes. So those first two ecosystems are on coastlines that are more rocky and more wave beaten, um, but in areas where we have river outflows and have lots of mud and sediments piling up, we also have incredibly diverse ecosystems, like some that are just in our neck of the woods right around here, like mud flats and salt marshes, also incredibly diverse and productive and offering a ton of different ecosystem services as well. And sometimes it's worth sitting back in taking a look at this incredible variety that we have in this area, if, in case you like are in the midst of our terrible winters or very muddy spring and falls and wondering why the hell you live in Atlanta, Canada, um, these are good reminders as to why. Um, and lastly, we also have seagrass beds, which are um, tend to be in sandier shorelines. They're also, I feel like, one of the most ignored and unappreciated of these coastal ecosystems. Um, we don't have tons of tourists flocking to see our seagrass beds like we do the mud flats or our rocky inner tidal areas. Um, but they're equally as important. Um, you can find a ton of amazing seagrass ecosystems along the Northumberland Strait around here. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of their uh, critical services as well. So before I do that, sorry, let me grab something here. Um, I want to ask the audience and Kind of peg you guys for some questions first. I, I'm not putting this question up um, 
to start giving you a list of answers for. I want to understand what you in the audience feel are the critical services that these things I just showed you, like especially these four local ecosystems, what they provide to you. Like if you had to make a case as to why we should protect them, um, what are the critical services, if we think about it in that way, as, as public services that they provide? Um, to you personally, but also to our communities. And, and we of course can talk about like having a good nature cry at a, at a beautiful ecosystem and um, experiencing the natural beauty of them. But um, let's assume we're talking to someone who is heartless and doesn't truly value nature. And we need to make a more economical or um, quality of life argument as to why we should protect this ecosystem. So I wanna turn it over to the audience and see what people think is in terms of what are some services that these ecosystems provide. Stop sharing. There we go. Can't see the chat window just yet, so give me a second to pull that up. But does anybody just want to shout something out? So we've got breathable air, food, flood mitigation, help provide shoreline, protect the shoreline. They also improve mental health. Now, again, now, now think that we're, we're, we're making an argument to someone who, who doesn't value any of that kind of self-care stuff, right? <laughs> which, um, which I, I could also think that we, we have a lot of things that we could argue are reasons to value our coastal ecosystems because of all of the amazing mental health and spiritual benefits they have for us. Uh, but if we just want to talk dollars and cents, um, there, there's definitely some things here that, that people are touching on. Um, yeah, I see a lot of good things. And a lot of these things are kind of along the lines that I, I kind of anticipated. A lot of us would say that we think about coastal ecosystem as protecting us from external threats, particularly in this area. I think we've all, at least those of us who care about environmental issues, have heard enough and, and or not enough, but I've heard a lot about um, some of the threats that our local ecosystems are under and also the value they provide to us in terms of preventing storm surges or the risks that uh, sea level rise presents to us and how our ecosystems can play a role in protecting us from that. So anything else that anyone wants to shout out? So I see seafood production, right? That's another classic one, right? And I'll, and I'll kind of mention a little more about that. So we have biodiversity, protecting our shoreline, breathable air, and very conveniently, none of my students who are present um, decided to like steal my punchline and say the thing that I was going to talk more about. So I appreciate that. Um, so let me resume the share here. But all great suggestions and all things that are totally accurate um ways that we have ecosystem services being provided by um, coastal systems so one of the things that we classically think of if i if i ask people that it was something that came up in what we saw in the chat there is that we think of coastal ecosystems as critical nurseries for a lot of different communities so they're not just harboring lots of biodiversity in themselves, but they also kind of provide a way station for a lot of other organisms that may go live in freshwater ecosystems or live farther offshore. Um, oh, sorry, take so long. There we go. Um, so they are able to provide these amazing nursery habitats for things that will grow up and be larger offshore stocks of fish that are critical for seafood protection. This is something that we're we, we've understood for a while, but it's only now starting to become a part of management practices, of acknowledging that if you want to preserve some kind of valuable, um, economically valuable fishery that exists offshore, it's often critical to protect a much smaller coastal ecosystem, which happens to be where those fish grow up in their earliest life stages and when they're most vulnerable. And, and coastal ecosystems provide this simply because 
they provide a concentrated area with lots of um, an abundance and diversity of food resources, but also for the simple fact that they represent a lot of structure and a lot of complex habitat in places for small fish and small organisms to hide from predators when they're at the early vulnerable stages of their lives. And like a bunch of people suggested, and, and people touched on, and one that's critical in this area is coastal ecosystems provide storm and flood protection. Simply having a large amount of plant material on the coastline when we have a large hurricane that rolls through here um, can, can trap sediments, can prevent erosion that would happen as a result of that storm. But also really critically, um, it, it can allow the actual wave impacts and the amount of floodwaters that would be coming into our area during a storm to be much lower than it would be simply because all that material will absorb the energy that is coming from wind and wave. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to look for my uh, phone here real quick so I have a sense of time. I realize I don't want to completely lose time and I can't see it on my screen. Okay, very good. <laughs> Um, doing good on time. So let me, so a, a great example I can give of this, um, and I should say it's not just things like our salt marshes that we think about in this area that, that we've had a lot of talks about, um, of our salt marshes providing coastal protection, protection from sea level rise. Uh, but it's also things like oyster reefs and reef structures. And it's some of the examples that are near and dear to my heart that I personally experienced because um, I used to live along the Gulf Coast and, and I spent some time in the Caribbean is that uh, there are ecosystems like mangrove forests or coral reefs as well that have provided life-saving um, incredible protection to coastal communities, very dense coastal communities um, as a result of um, absorbing the impacts from hurricanes. And on the flip side, we've also have really good evidence that a lack of these ecosystems has resulted in a large amount of deaths because we did not preserve them. A great example of this is in the area south of New Orleans. Um, the management practice of the coastline um, led to lots of uh, freshwater coming into, um, sorry, lots of seawater coming into areas that are typically more fresh um, in all the bayous south of New Orleans, and that caused a massive die off of these large mangrove forests, which are like large swampland forests if you're not familiar with the mangrove. Um, and there's very good data showing that during Hurricane Katrina, if those forests had still been there, uh, basically the dikes don't break and hundreds of people don't lose their lives um, simply if we just left the forest in place. Um, and there are similar stories that have come from some of the major hurricane impacts in places like Puerto Rico where the, the fact that they've managed to protect and maintain some amazing coral reef ecosystems right off the shore of a large city like San Juan, Puerto Rico, absorbed a huge amount of wave impact that would have caused a lot of destruction to the city um, during the hurricanes that have come there in the last few years, like Hurricane Maria. So these are classic services that we think about with coastal ecosystems. But the one I kind of want to focus on more here um, to get into some detail and less on hype and, and love for our coastal ecosystems is more about burying carbon. So we're often thinking about our coastal ecosystems being threatened by climate change, by them being places that are being affected by rising global temperatures, as well as places that are being affected, obviously very directly by sea level rise. But one of the most hopeful and inspiring things that I think about with coastal ecosystems is that they're not only, they might be at the greatest threat from climate change, but they also present the biggest bang for our buck in terms of directly fighting against climate change. So coastal ecosystems greatly punch above their weight in terms of how much carbon they bear. And just for a little background, um, assuming people are familiar with a lot of these terms, but we understand that climate change and our the variability in our rising global temperatures are driven by our release of carbon dioxide of the atmosphere. And one of the only ways we can prevent that long-term or mitigate it long-term is to start getting that CO2 out of the atmosphere. And there, we often think about things like the Amazon rainforest or large forests where we have plants that are sucking up CO2 and then locking it away into wood. And we think about that as a way of storing carbon. Uh, but what we often miss is that these coastal ecosystems present far more 
potential to store carbon. And this also represents a pretty good economic argument to make for people who maybe don't care about biodiversity or having glorious ecosystems around us. Because if we create systems where people can sell carbon credits or get economic value directly for preserving some ecosystem that buries carbon, right? These are the best places to do it because they store more carbon per square meter than any other kind of ecosystem. Uh, on top of that, we are loaded with them here in Atlantic Canada. So again, if you want to make a pure economic argument, like this is this is a gold mine for the it, for a way to make money off the idea of selling carbon credits and burying them in a closed ecosystem. Simply because we have this amazing diversity of them in this area, but also because we have greatly degraded a lot of them. So there's a lot of open space to restore them. Um, and I should explain why is it that coastal ecosystems provide this carbon storage? Why are, are they able to punch above their weight, as I said, in terms of storing carbon? Well, the secret sauce for this, uh, you need to have any kind of amount of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and burying it in the earth is first, you generally need lots of plants to collect that carbon from the atmosphere. You need plants doing photosynthesis, sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere to make their own food. Um, but that's not all. It also helps to be producing and accumulating lots of dead plants, right? Because living plants are sucking up CO2, but they're also consuming the food that they make and breaking it down and essentially exhaling CO2, just like we do as well. So if you really want to store it long-term and pull out the atmosphere long-term, you have to pull that CO2 out of the atmosphere, put in the plant material, and then stick it somewhere where it's going to stay, stay around. Um, the last step of being able to make this happen is that you want to bury that dead plant material in a place where it is not simply just going to get recycled. So if it decomposes and gets broke down by microbes, as all things do, like leaf litter on a forest floor, um, those microbes, as they're breaking it down, they do the same thing to food that we do. They take foods like sugars and proteins and, and, and nutritious things like that and break them down into carbon dioxide and exhale them. So if that material just gets recycled and gets broken down, it's not being pulled out of the atmosphere long term. So I, I, I spared, I removed a bunch of the numbers, but this is one graph that I can't help but show. Anyone who's taken my classes has probably seen this before because it's a, a very interesting and powerful figure. So bear with me, I am gonna show some data, um, but I think this is pretty accessible stuff. So what you're looking at is data from a paper that looked at how much carbon is present on a per area basis. So we're talking about the element carbon locked up into uh, living or recently living things, uh, and biological material across the planet. So on the left, you're looking at how much carbon is stored in a variety of different ecosystems. On the right, you're looking at how much carbon flows through those ecosystems. In other words, what amount of it is, is moving out of that ecosystem into other places? into possibly just be able to be used by other ecosystems or maybe to be stored in other ecosystems uh, per time. And again, I want to make the point that when we think about carbon storage and we think about using nature to get CO2 out of the atmosphere, we think about forest. So look at this, this graph and look at where we see forest. So you can see uh, Norway spruce uh, forest, Scots pine, beech forest, temperate oaks, Mediterranean oaks, uh, you see that they all represent a pretty large amount of carbon um, relatively on this graph. And note the colors in the blue. The light blue is carbon that's in living material. So in this case, we're talking about tree trunks, leaves. And the dark blue is carbon that's buried underground in dead leaf material and, and soil carbon in those forests. Um, and one thing that might not immediately register with a lot of people is the fact that a seagrass bed which just looking at it represents, looks like it's way less stuff than a forest is, completely blows these forests away in terms of how much carbon they store. And you can also notice that a salt marsh, um, called tidal marsh on here, and I'm not talking about our tidal marshes, but the numbers would be comparable. Um, they represent 
a similar amount of carbon being stored on our planet compared to a forest filled with giant trees. And again, stop to think about that for a second. You're looking at a coastline with some knee-high grasses versus trees that are towering above you. And if I were to just tell you, oh, there's way more carbon here on this marshland than there is in this forest, you would have trouble believing that. And the reason for that is though, if you look, notice that the, the bars for the seagrass and the petal marsh are almost all dark blue. It's all stuff that's buried underground. So there might not be a ton of carbon in those grasses, in seagrasses and salt marshes. But what they, they do is grow very quickly. They produce a lot of dead grass every year and so much of it gets stored and buried. Another really important thing that you can take away from this is if you look at the very top, if you look at kelp forests. So kelp forests don't have that ability to bury things underground and bury carbon. They don't have that secret sauce, like I mentioned. Like a part of that of, of ability to bury carbon in a coastal ecosystem typically involves you need some place to bury it. You need some place to store that carbon underground where it won't be decomposed. And kelp forests attach to rocks. They live on rocky shorelines. So there isn't a place directly accessible to them where they could bury dead kelp. But if you look at the graph on the right and actually look at how much carbon flows out of kelp forests, it's huge. And it's way larger than we see for forests. In other words, kelps grow really quickly and lots of that kelp material breaks off and gets taken out of the kelp forest. And this also allows kelps to make a huge contribution to carbon storage through a kind of more indirect way. So we might not think of something that is living on rocks that can't bury things as being a huge part of burying carbon on our planet, but kelps, um, including the kelp forests around here, but especially kelp forests in the Pacific, uh, actually have a huge role in how the planet cycles carbon and how we store carbon across the planet. And I should note, again, this is one of the things that gives me hope and gets me excited, is that we didn't understand this role for kelps until very recently, like within the last 10 years. Um, so kelp forests grow really rapidly, but they're also kind of soft and tender. They're algae, not trees, right? So when waves hit them um, or other animals nibble on them and things like that, a lot of that kelp growth gets broken off and gets carried offshore. And if you've looked at kelps or some of the rock weeds that we have in intertidal zones, like if you've gone walking around low tide at um, uh, Johnson Mills or at like Fundy National Park um, at the Hopo Rocks, you probably noticed that a lot of the algae has little air bladders in it, that they have little pockets of air that let them float so that they can stay up in the well-lit parts of the water when the tide is in. Kelps are no different. Kelps have these things too. They have these little air bladders that let them float. So when kelps get broken off in a kelp forest, they get carried out offshore. Um, so they don't, they not only can they not get buried because they don't live on top of mud and dirt, but also they float. So they get carried out to the ocean. But then eventually they break down enough that their little air bladders pop and they can sink. And now instead of sinking onto a shallow, shallow rocky, uh, sorry, shallow rocky coast, they sink in very deep ocean waters, where when things get buried in the bottom of the ocean, they stay there forever. So even though kelps represent a really small amount of carbon on our planet, like they don't even, they're not even a drop in the bucket compared to a forest, a huge fraction of all the growth in a kelp forest gets sent way offshore and shuttled down to the deep ocean and locked away forever. So this is a process we did not fully appreciate, but it makes another point of what kind of services we get out of something like a kelp forest, something that we might not have typically expected before of the kind of values that they have. Not just necessarily harboring diversity or harboring some important fish species, but kelps are burying tons of carbon in this kind of interconnected large scale way that we didn't appreciate before. And in highlighting that, it's also worth pointing out that kelps are one of the most threatened ecosystems in our region, right? So kelps are experiencing a multiplicity of threats that are challenging their ability to do this and provide this service for us. Uh, this kind of gets back to my original point that um, we're talking about ecosystems 
foods that can help protect us against climate change, but also are threatened by climate change. But then we can kind of be overwhelmed by the fact that there's way more threats than just climate change. So kelps don't like warm water. They generally do not like water over 20 C. And so that's a problem in a warming world. Um, additionally, as kelps might try to move to colder waters, they might not be able to get into those colder waters. That's what we call a problem of biogeographic barriers. So there's a lot of estimates that kelps will just move farther north. We'll have more kelp forests in Newfoundland and places like that. Well, that sounds great, but that assumes that there's a welcoming, loving environment for those kelps and not other organisms there that would compete with those kelps in those places. Um, on top of that, we've lost a lot of key organisms that help keep kelp forests in balance, like predators that would keep the things that eat kelps in check. Um, and also we have the problem of nutrient pollution. So excess nutrients that come from our fertilizers and from uh, sewage and things like that feed into organisms that can compete with kelp or make the water cloudier and rob the kelps of light. And this is a major threat for kelps, uh, particularly in our area as well. And I should point out that when we're thinking about these kind of threats, again, kind of tie this back to our coastal ecosystem. One thing that it's worth noting when we're talking about coastal threats and climate change is that we are really getting the, the, the brunt of climate change in our area. Um, granted, there are places, um, particularly close to the equator, where human life is going to be far more disrupted by climate change. Right, places that rely on monsoon rain or places that are really low-lying islands or things like that. But in terms of the threats to our coastal ecosystems and the diversity that, that's at stake, um, it's important to remember that we live near a part of the ocean that is warming at a much faster rate than the rest of the planet. So uh, I'm just taking a slice of a global map here, but what you can see in this map on the right, um, the hot colors are showing you places, essentially the rate of change um, in water temperatures due to climate change. And you can see a couple hot spots in the map. You see one in the Northwest Pacific and you see another one in the Northwest Atlantic. And if you zoom in, you're like, oh, look, there's my house right next to that big blob of red. So globally, we are worried about marine organisms and coastal ecosystems being threatened by rising temperatures. But that is a major concern in our area because simply the temperatures are rising much faster here than they are in other places. So another ecosystem that's threatened that does a lot of this carbon barrel, like I showed you in that graph, is the, the Bay of Fundy salt marshes. Um, and again, th this is pointing to some of the other threats, but also the huge potential that we have to reclaim some of these ecosystems and remove a ton of carbon that causes climate change from the atmosphere simply by letting these ecosystems exist. So, uh, these are the kind of systems in the restoration that Dr. Aller had talked about in his talk last year. Um, and I definitely, like I said, I encourage folks to talk about that, uh, look, go look into that. Um, but I can say that the short uh, version of the story is that 85 to 90% of our salt marshes have been lost around the Bay of Fundy since colonization. And a lot of this is due um, to the construction of dikes, our, our classic sluice dikes that we see around here where we establish these dikes, they prevent um, salt water from reaching marshlands. Um, and then eventually those marshlands drain um, with rainwater coming through them and draining water through them and removes the salts from the soil. And then you get nice fertile soil that you can raise cows on and things like that, but you've lost a salt marsh in the process. And you've cut that area off from the constant flow of seawater that makes a salt marsh possible. Um, but there are places like in, in the Bobasan Marsh, the project that Dr. Allerhead um, has worked on and is, and is presented about, where we've had uh, collaborators from across the area helping to reestablish um, salt marshes and look at the, the process of establishing them. And this is also highlights a key point that if, if you're convinced that like, okay, it sounds like a great idea to make the pitch of restoring coastal ecosystems, simply because they represent this huge way of storing carbon. It's worth pointing out that we don't just magically know how to do this. Um, in many cases, actively restoring an ecosystem requires years of research effort. And a lot of these things are not necessarily intuitive. Um, it is difficult to figure out how to fix things once we have broken them, is the short answer. Um, but one kind of hopeful side of this in our local salt marsh restoration is that 
we have these efforts here around for Bozajor, where there's marsh restorations, but just a little farther down the coastline towards Nova Scotia, there is a similar amount of area that has naturally restored itself um, in terms of salt marshes. It just took almost a century to do. But when dikes were abandoned and no longer maintained around the Great Depression, they eventually got eroded and broke down. And since then, a huge amount of salt marsh has reestablished and restored itself in the area, kind of in the area close to where you see the windmills um, past the marsh towards Amherst. So a lot of these things, they might be difficult to do quickly um, on our time scale, but a lot of it will just happen naturally if things are given space and time. And one thing I wanna throw out here, it's rough to end on some data, but this is, I, I can't help myself because this is one of the most hopeful scientific stories I can, I can share. It's something that I harp on in my classes. So uh, don't get lost in all the numbers, but I'll talk you through this, but this is gonna make a pretty good case for why we should care about restoring salt marshes in our area. And especially when we're thinking about keeping salt marshes around um, and giving space for them to exist rather than uh, just trying to build more dikes in order to preserve the causeway between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia or something like that. So what you're looking at is, is models or simulations, but based on a lot of data and we have a lot of confidence in this. Um, this is some, from some really groundbreaking research that came out in the last couple of years. So the different graphs you're seeing are different climate change scenarios. So the one on the left is uh, an overly optimistic scenario where we have very little sea level rise in the next century. And the, the middle one is kind of a moderate sea level scenario. So maybe we kind of get our act together, but eh, not so much. And we still have quite a bit of sea level rise, about 50 centimeters of sea level rise by the year 2100, which I should know doesn't seem like a lot, but that would be a major problem for a community like ours. And then there's the business as usual scenario, um, which is if we don't do anything, um, about carbon emissions and keep letting it rip, um, we can have very high sea level rise um, by the year 2100. And I should note that these numbers, these estimates are actually quite conservative, even in the business as usual scenario in terms of how much sea level rise we can get. The colors that you're seeing on the graph are different human approaches to dealing with this sea level rise. So the red colors is showing you, again, more business as usual of us not leaving room for salt marshes to grow and expand. Um, the kind of pinkish beige uh, color is what happens if we allow some adaptation. Like we, we, if we have some communities that are starting to flood or some areas that are unstable near the coastlines, maybe we don't rebuild after a big storm. Or maybe we, you know, just, don't allow certain types of coastal construction in areas where there's a lot of sea level rise and, and coastal wetlands and salt marshes. Um, and the yellow scenario is the, the kind of more optimistic view of we actively retreat from certain coastal areas that we know are gonna be underwater in 50 years, that we know are gonna be unsustainable to inhabit. Um, and what's amazing if you look, about, if you look at this is that even in the worst case scenario, the graph on the right, and us kind of just half-assing our response to climate change. What you're seeing on the graph is like the positive numbers on the right is an increase in the amount of coastal wetlands that we have, like salt marshes. And if it's the numbers are negative, we lose it. So even in, we, if we do nothing about climate change and just do a little bit to give salt marshes and things like that some space, we could actually end up with 20 to 40% more salt marshes due to that climate change, due to sea level rise. Because as the coastline rises, the salt marshes are gonna spread into inland, essentially. And if you look at other scenarios where we have lots of good management and we still have really high sea level rise, you see that we could actually have a boom of salt marshes. And so this might seem kind of confusing, like why is there actually more salt marsh growth with sea level rise um, than there is on those graphs on the left when there isn't as much sea level rise? Some sea level rise is really good for salt marshes because it means more land getting flooded and carrying in the mud that they grow on. Um, but if the, if the marsh is allowed to grow faster than the sea level rises, which they do, uh, they will outrun sea level rise and they will expand. 
So if we simply give salt marsh a space, right, we, will, we would actually end up with way more salt marshes that do this incredible job of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, rather than losing that, as we classically think of happening when we talk about sea level rise. So the key thing here to think about, and again, think about how positive that is on, on multiple levels. By simply just not doing something, we can restore a valuable ecosystem that protects us from storms, that uh, harbors a nursery habitat for fish um, and valuable fisheries, uh, and also pulls more CO2 out of the atmosphere per area than any other kind of ecosystem. And it's something that's going to naturally just happen on its own just by getting out of the way. So, it, and it's happening because of sea level rise, but at the same time, it's also sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere and helping to resist further sea level rise and further climate change. So uh, I, I like solutions that involve just letting nature fix things on its own. Um, and granted, this is easier said than done because we're talking about, you know, sacrificing certain land areas and things like this. And I know this is a current debate around here, but, and it's hard to deal with numbers and models and things like this, but there's no better concrete evidence I can provide for an argument for just not trying to build dikes everywhere and trying to fight the sea. In some cases, just letting the ocean reclaim some areas could have huge benefits um, in terms of coastal restoration and climate change. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. I was going to um, get into some stuff if we had time for seagrasses, but uh, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, this is just kind of more of my backup extra material on seagrasses. We'll save that for next time. Uh, Thank you. So, so with that, Oh yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Lefer. Um, there is there there is a question in the chat um, from Sean. How does coastline for carbon capture compare to river banks or beds? So that, that's a great question. Um, it, it and, and I don't want to give a classic scientist answer of well, it depends. Uh, but when you think about a riverbank or an area adjacent to a river, it's important to kind of distinguish, are we talking about a true riverbank or are we talking about maybe a river that feeds into some large freshwater wetland? We're talking about a large wetland area that is gonna be similar to a salt marsh where you have lots of stagnant, muddy areas where things can get buried and preserved and lots of grass growth, then those may be areas that represent um, a good amount of carbon storage. Uh, on the flip side though, Freshwater wetlands also present the kind of mixed bag problem that we don't see as much with salt marshes. And that is that um, they also release methane, which is a greenhouse gas. So they, they, they don't have as much of a net bang for our buck in terms of fighting climate change as, as something like a salt marsh does. Um, but I should also point out, if you think about a river bank, they tend to be more erosional environments, right? They're inherently changing and moving and cutting new paths for themselves. And salt marshes are also dynamic and changing, but the salt marsh is changing by just growing and expanding and moving inland and burying more carbon as it does that. So uh, riverbanks can present some carbon storage. I would argue that they're really important to conserve for different reasons, mainly as habitat for preserving river diversity and habitats for fish, because riverbanks also provide those same kind of nursery benefits we talked about coastal ecosystems. Does that help answer that? Uh, I see a question from Barb. Uh, so this mean you would not recommend raising the dikes in the Tanchamar Marsh uh, to protect the highway. Um, boy. Uh, do I give my my brutally, you know, anti-human answer or a more diplomatic in public being recorded online answer. Um, I, I think that with everything, it depends. I, I think uh, Jeff Allerhead's response to questions like this in his talk is really worth looking at because Jeff knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, and, and, and his basic response is, you know, we need to be practical. We need to be pragmatic. 
In some cases, it might not make a lot of sense to just let salt marshes run wild and take over area. So there might be some areas where we have to strike a balance. And yeah, we got to build a dike to protect the road. But the bottom line is like, if the only solution, which is the problem from the, gov the, the, the provincial government, like the only solution that was offered was more dikes and marsh restoration was not part of the plan or acknowledged as a thing that exists. So um, if the only plan is building dirt walls against a rising ocean, um, we are inherently fighting a losing battle and throwing away money. Um, whereas if we take a more long-term view of are there some places we can sacrifice and get huge benefits from that in terms of coastal restoration and also save money by not building a dike that's going to get knocked down in 20 to 50 years, um, then I think that's the answer. Um, but I think we have some, the bottom line is no matter what you, how you value coastal ecosystems, there's no escaping the fact that no matter what we build or how we try to manage the pantry of our area, um, we are fighting a losing battle. And there's no engineering solution that's been offered that's going to be uh, a panacea that's going to solve the problem. So we need to think long term and we need to get creative if we don't want to have problems and don't want to just waste money fighting this problem is, is, the, is the bottom line that I would say. Um, I'm kind of like all of the above. Let's look at it on a micro scale, but we need to think long term and we need to think about a diversity of options. Thank you. Um... I think we can make room for one more question, but after that, uh, Dr. Leifer, if you're okay with it, could we share your Mount Allison email? Um, so if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, they can do that. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had it in earlier slides. So yeah. Sorry. I thought I, I, I thought you heard me say. Oh, you're all good. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to just like stare you down for asking that. No, I, yeah, please. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions um, from folks. Great. Um, and to the participants, we will also send the link. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, we have a form, a workshop evaluation form mm -hmm. um, that we'll put in the chat. Um, and thank you so much to Dr. Leifer for presenting on such a, an important and significant topic. And we'd also like to thank our funder, the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund, for funding this free webinar today. Um, yeah, so we're putting that evaluation in the chat now, but thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming, folks. I really appreciate it.